Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today, we are welcoming back to the show one of our favorite guests, the legendary Mr. G. Edward Griffin. He is the author of several best-selling books, including The Creature from Jekyll Island, which is a famous expose upon the Federal Reserve System. Mr. Griffin has opposed the Fed since the 1960s, saying that it constitutes a banking cartel and in that philosophy he has founded the Red Pill University. Today he is chairman of the Red Pill Expo. He is a writer, a film producer, and the founder of Freedom Force International. Ed, welcome back to the show. How are you today? Well, thank you. I'm, I'm very well. I hope you are well also. Oh, yes, and we are so excited. It's always such a privilege to have you here. And of course, Ed, we're going to start right off the top with the Fed. Throughout your career, you have been researching the Federal Reserve System and you understand it like no other. As you watch what is happening right now, how do you feel about whether or not the Fed would have been better to have been under the control of the United States government as opposed to being an independent entity all of this time. Talk to us about the historical relevance of the Fed being independent and the way this independence has played out. Everything is going crazy throughout the world. Tell us what's happening. Well, I wish I really knew everything that's happening, but I certainly agree with your assessment. Everything is going crazy. But you know, it's been going crazy inch by inch for quite a few years. And uh, your questions are very profound, uh, more so than they may sound to our viewers, because the, there are some assumptions in there. It would it have been better, you ask, if the Fed had not been uh, independent, had it been under control of the federal government? And uh, <clears throat> my answer may surprise you, and that is that, in my view, it wouldn't make any difference because the power of the Fed is so great that, uh, in my view, it's just the opposite of what, what they teach in the school, that the, the Federal Reserve was created by Congress, of course it was, and that the, uh, our wise uh, elected representatives <clears throat> are watching it carefully and they're controlling it and uh, they're, they're monitoring it and so forth. And somehow we get the impression that the government is controlled over it. But your question reveals that you have a deeper understanding that the, about the only control that the Fed has is it does, I mean, that the government has, is that it has the power to abolish it. It, it, could, it could adjust, it could revise the Federal Reserve Act. So Congress does, in a sense, ultimately have control over it. They could say, okay, here's the whistle, they'll blow the whistle, say, you guys are through. You get 30 days, pack your bag and get out. They can still do that. But it's until they do that, and you know they're not because they're so beholden to the financial industry that it would be their political suicide to do that. But if they did do that, uh, well, well, then uh, they, you know, what, what, what would be the difference? Uh, if, they, if the federal government controlled the banks, but the banks controlled the congressmen, you see, so the banks control themselves. In other words, the, the Federal Reserve and the government have become pretty much one and the same. And you'll notice that there's kind of a revolving door. People come out of government positions and then they go into top positions with the banking institutions. And just like with the FDA, the, the head of the FDA is the former president of some pharmaceutical company. And it's a revolving door. And to the outsider, it looks like, oh my gosh, we've got industry over here being regulated by the government. But what do you know? The industry people are the heads of the regulatory agencies after all. And so it's gotten to be like a can of worms, if you really understand how it works. So saying who is going to be in charge is kind of a, what, what difference does does it make? Uh, it, it's more for show. It's all one entity right now. It's a conglomeration. It's a partnership between government and industry. And when you start looking at the personality level and how these interlocking organizations work, you find it really, for practical purposes, it is a cartel uh, with, in partnership with the federal government. And it, the who, who controls it, it is not an issue because they're one unity, uh, one entity in itself. Now, uh, if you if they were to abolish the Federal Reserve and turn all of the power that the Fed has over to the Treasury, does anybody really think it would make any difference? Because 
the treasury is controlled by the same people too. Look, look who the secretaries of the treasury are. They all come from the banking industry and from the financial industry, right? I mean, they're the ones that are running the show, folks. So there's all this talk about, well, who should have control? Maybe we should pass a new law. It means that we're not looking deep enough at the real problem. The real problem is systemic corruption. And you're not going to fix it just by saying, well, we're going to put the spotlight over here and make these guys seem like they're not important. It, unless you get to the core of it and really, uh, and, and you, what we need, in my view, I'll run to the cut to the chase. So if that's true, what can you do? And the question is, you can change the system. You can, you can recognize that no one, whether it's banking or government, no one should have the power to force people to accept money that they don't want. It's the monopoly power over money that we give either to banks or to governments or to them together. I don't care really who has it. If anybody can tell me that I have to use for my money, the money that they create, and then they can do anything they want to with it. They can inflate it. They can create billions and trillions of dollars that more like they are doing now. Uh, like every day, you know, they're putting billions and billions of dollars into the economy every day now. And yet I have to accept that money, even though we know it by just any school child would know that when you do that, the value of that money eventually is going to just go down and down and collapse until finally it'll be worthless. So I have to accept that money or I go to prison. There is the problem. If we didn't have that idea, if people were free to say, I don't want to use this money, I want to use cryptocurrency, or I want to use the blue chip stamps, or I want to make my own money and see if anybody else wants to use it too. I want freedom to choose. If that were the situation, then these people couldn't do that game because we all of us would have the freedom to walk away from it and let them collapse their own system and we could be independent. of it. So the question you raise is deeper than it seems because it's kind of a, it's touching the surface and we're, we're, we're playing their game by accepting their vision of what we, what they want us to think the system is, that it, it's, that you can control it it's simply by passing another law and passing ownership from this person to that person. And they're all corrupt, you see. So my answer probably is not very uh, satisfactory to most people, but that's how I see it. And that's how you, you gave me that freedom to uh, speak as, as it was in my mind. Yes, something definitely has to be done. And you've also correctly noted that everything is crazy right now. It's always been crazy because it's been based on some fundamental, fundamentally incorrect and crazy principles like the one I just mentioned. Uh, but now the wheels are coming off. And uh, it's just incredible to see what's happening. I think anybody that's an, a reasonably well-informed observer, even if they adhere to the to the old mythology of what the Federal Reserve System is, even even at that level, you can see that you cannot create money at the, at the rampant speed that's being done now and expect everything to turn out all right. This story cannot end well. And I think we're coming close to the end. Right. You mentioned the term mythology. Um, these are such extraordinary points because the Federal Reserve being completely independent and uh, your picture that you painted, we simply buy into the mythology that we must use that system that's not even part of our government. No. And that as you know, the massive number of people on this planet that we're not allowed to have our own monetary system is extraordinary when you really absorb that. Yes, and even if we were allowed to have it, if we turned this all over to the, those nice, reliable, honest, trustworthy politicians, instead of those big bad bankers, why those nice politicians would protect us, wouldn't they? The answer is no. <laughs> it would be the same game, only with different crooks in the, in the top position. In fact, as long as the banks are allowed to issue the nation's money, which they are now, hear that everybody. The Federal Reserve System is a cartel of private banks. It has nothing to do with your government. It appears like it does because they issue your government money. And Congress gave them that power back in 1913 when they passed the first Federal Reserve Act. So here we have a, a powerful cartel of private banks, the biggest banks in the United States, and the, the government gave them, just gave them on a silver platter, the power to create the monetary 
system or the, the dollars, the money itself for the United States government. And then not only that, but these banks said, well, thank you very much. Now we'll issue the dollars. And so what the dollar stopped saying United States uh, treasury notes. Now it says Federal Reserve notes. If you haven't noticed, it has the United States of America on top of it, but that's just like a frame, a window, a dressing, a fancy frame around the cartel. It's the United States of America, but it doesn't mean anything. But look at the monetary statement on the, in the bills. It says a Federal Reserve note. It's owned by the Federal Reserve, and if you, and issued by the Federal Reserve, if you understand that the Federal Reserve is nothing but a cartel, like a banana cartel or an oil cartel, this happens to be a banking cartel, then you begin to get grasp of the huge mythology that's, that we've been taught to accept that somehow this is in our best interest. Well, wake up everybody and smell the coffee. It's getting pretty strong now. Exactly. Ed, let's turn now to the number one topic of the moment, which of course is the coronavirus. This global economic catastrophe has proven to us that the governments and the central banks will never let credit freeze or the system crash. They will continue to inflate it despite the unknown future ramifications that may happen. How do you believe that this is all going to play out in terms of um, the other side of the COVID-19 crisis? Well, it's a tough one to answer because um, I have to answer honestly, and I, when I, I have to preface my remarks with that because there's a temptation when you have a view like I do that is unpopular. It's a view that nobody wants to believe is true. They want to live in la-la land. And, and they ask me, what do you think? Oh, fine, I'll tell you what I think. And wham, wham, well, who invited him to the party? You know, <laughs> and there's a temptation to soften it and to make it sound not the way you really think it because you don't want people to think ill of you or to think that you're crazy. But um, I've never done that in my life. And the few times I tried it when I was young, it didn't work out very well. So uh, I'm going to just answer your question the way I see it. And uh, you mentioned that they won't allow the system to crash. Well, they cannot stop it from crashing now. It's just gone too far. But beyond that, I, I'm rather convinced that they want it to crash. They know it's going to crash sooner or later because you can't continue to inflate the money supply uh, without the system crashing. This has been done folks, many, many times in history, going way, way back in history. There are a lot of nations, a lot of uh, political systems that have issued money and gone crazy with the ability to just keep issuing more and more and more. Once we got off of the, of the bullion standard, when money was actually something that you had to make, something that was, took human effort and therefore the supply was limited, like gold or silver, you had to dig it out of the ground, had to, had to refine it, you know, uh, or even in more primitive systems where you had, there were certain things like diamonds or precious stones or even rare seashells and so forth. In all cases, it, there was a time when tobacco uh, in, the, in the American continent was used as money, tobacco leaves. It, but in all cases, these things took human effort to produce or to acquire in some way and it was limited in quantity, and uh, it had some intrinsic value. People would take it even if it weren't for money, which is why they took it as money, because it had some other value. But once they got away from that, and they, and they, and they got this thing that Gutenberg made to call the printing press, and they started to print money just on paper. Bing, 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 bing. There's another thousand. There's over 20,000. There's 100,000. Oh, this is fun. And once they got into that thing, <laughs> why? the world would never be the same again because all all systems collapsed when they did that and that by the way they did this in china first uh, long before the printing press they uh, they made money out of tree bark and there was a certain basque behind the pine bark or, and other trees and it was like a like a leathery uh, paper and they uh, the emperor of china actually decreed that you cut those little things into squares stamp it with some uh, imperial seals put some red vermilion on it, and some officials put their X or Y or their Z on it, and that's official money, and if you don't use it, you die. 
So it goes way, way back. Every time, my point is, every time that has been done, the system uh, economically collapsed eventually. Because if, you, if you're given the power to create money out of nothing, you know what you're going to do? You're going to create money out of nothing. And a lot of it, and a lot more of it, and even more of it, and finally so much of it that it has no value, even under pain of death, to accept it. So we know how this works. And, uh, and certainly the people we're talking about that we don't approve who are making these decisions, they know, they're not uh, ignorant, they pretend like, oh, everything is fine, but they know that the system cannot go on forever. And it's just a question of how long can they keep kicking the can down the road. They know, I think they decided about probably six months or nine months ago that, well, it's, it's coming really close now, so let's, uh, let's go for broke. And uh, I'm sure, in fact, I know, I say I'm sure I know because I've been reading their papers for years. They've been planning uh, on what to do once the U.S. dollar and all the other major currencies are recognized as so worthless that nobody wants them and they're not being accepted. And great economic um, uh, crises are happening and boomeranging around. What do you do? They've been planning this, holding international conferences on it for quite a few years. And their decision has always been, well, to dump it, let it dump, and let it go, and, and use the crisis that follows as an excuse to accept a new system that will be offered to the dumbbells out there as the solution to this problem that they created in the first place. Now we turn to them, and they're creating a solution to their own problem that they created, and that new solution would be a, a new money. It would be international money of some kind. Uh, they tend to like to call it the Amaro but who knows what it'll be actually called. And it'll be just as worthless as all the others, but it'll be new. And in the beginning, they may even say, well, we've got to, got to sell this to the yokels out there. So let's say, uh, how can we make it look good? Oh, I know, we'll put a little gold behind it. We'll say, well, we'll, we'll put some gold into the basket of, of currencies. We'll put some gold and silver and things in there. And all those gold buffs will hear the word, oh, there's gold in there. Well, maybe this is pretty good. Well, the ratio will be probably 10% or 5%, something very, very small. And, and anyway, it's just a sales gimmick because after it's in place, we know that they will take the gold out of it. It was just a sales gimmick. Here's your gold, now we take the gold away 10 years later and it's back to exactly where we are now. So I, I think I know their, their game plan. They plan to crash the system or allow it to crash, but they, they prefer to call the date themselves because they're heavily invested in, in um, investments the real estate and, and equities and so forth. And so when the crash comes, they don't want to be in the market. They want to be out ahead. They want to know what the date is. So when it comes, then they can buy up all the equities, you know, pennies on the dollar. They've done this many times, particularly in the Great Depression in the 1930s. They made a killing on the uh, collapse. And of course, when you study the history, you find out that they, they really were the people that took the pin and went, pop, today is the day. And so uh, I think about six or seven, eight months ago, they decided to get that pin out and they're sharpening it. And they're, they're actually popping it right now, if you just see what they're doing, because they're putting so much money into the system. That bubble is getting so big so fast. The, the surface tension on the bubble is so so thin that it's not going to take anything but a, like, a, whoops, excuse me, madam, kind of a pop and the whole thing will go boom. But the point now I'm reading, leading to is that they're ready for this. They actually, I think they think this now is the time, 2020. And now along comes coronavirus. Now how convenient, because now when it pops, uh, and it certainly is that they're adding to it by put, taking people out of the workforce by the millions. So if this isn't an extra strain on top of the already weakened and dying system, this is the killer, this is the killer blow. This is the euthanasia to the system. They're making it pop now with that. But they can blame it on, oh, look, it's the coronavirus. We had nothing to do with it. I mean, the banks had nothing to do with it. It was that, that well, we had to take people out of, off the streets and put them in their homes for their own good, you understand. We're really the good guys here. We're not doing this on purpose. We, we don't have any ulterior motives, you understand. And we're really helping you folks. And you want to be putting medals on our chests for being such good guys. But uh, they're, the coronavirus, I think, is a really great cover and uh, I'll get back to that in a second but uh, to the 
cover part, uh, I mean, to the, the uh, fraudulent part of the virus itself. But looking strictly at the economic issue, I think it's a great cover uh, for the fact that the economy is under attack right now. The pen has been inserted and that sound, we're hearing that sound is the beginning of the pop. <laughs> and uh, we're, I think we're right at the right at the cutting edge of it right now. And so when it happens, people will be out of work. They won't be able to pay their rent. They won't be able to buy food. In fact, there will be a food shortage because we know a lot of uh, farmers are having to kill their livestock and their chickens and they're letting the fruit rot on the ground because they can't, they, the supply systems have been interrupted. They've got the food, but they can't deliver it into the supermarkets. The, the systems are all clogged up. And so we're reading stories on the back page now where they're, um, they're destroying food at a horrific rate. And, uh, and I, I am told that probably within about a week or two, that will ricochet back and the, the shelves on the, mark, on the supermarkets once again are gonna start getting thin. Maybe not so much because of boarding and panic, but simply because the supply chain is, is broken. And uh, even if it doesn't get thin, the prices will go up because the, the supply is limited. So uh, everything looks bad and I hate to say it. I, I'd rather just say, oh, well, everything's gonna be fine. But um, you asked me what I thought and I, I see that we're in the, in, in the middle of the cauldron right now. It, it, it's now. Yeah, we've been talking about what could happen. Oh, that dark cloud over the horizon. Hey, look, it's up overhead right now. It's here, it's here. And we're just beginning to see the beginning of it. And all this lockdown and this nonsense, they say, well, it's, it's only for 30 days. And now, well, it's only for 90 days. And now they're saying, well, it could be for a couple of years, you know, because this coronavirus is a very dangerous thing. And everything they, they say, well, it's only temporary, but everything they do shows that they really want to make this permanent because they want to change society. Now, that's about as bad uh, news as I know how to deliver to you. And, uh, but that's my opinion. Now, on the coronavirus itself, uh, I have been forced to really take a serious interest in the medical side and the biological side of that. And uh, we've been in contact with a lot of top, really top ranking physicians and researchers on this. These are not people who read books and newspaper articles or take their information from the internet. These are practicing physicians, uh, prize winning physicians, heads of big medical organizations, people with degrees from MIT and, and oh, these are top people. And every one of them are telling us that the coronavirus is a nothing burger and it's it's real yeah of course we how many viruses are there uh we we live with trillions of viruses in our bodies every day we're born with them in fact they these doctors these these uh, biologists tell us that between viruses and other pathogens like uh, uh, bacteria the, the bacteria and the viruses make up more of our bodies than our cells do and we're actually walking stacks of viruses and bacteria uh, all throughout our cellular system. And it's not just that we can live with them, but it turns out that they're actually beneficial to us, most of them. Some of them are not. And, um, and we'll get into that in a second. I'm trying to condense this for you. But the point is that the virus, this coronavirus, is no different than any of the other viruses, except that uh, it might have been engineered. That's another issue. If it was, I think they failed. Uh, if, it, if it was engineered in China as a, a weapon of war, uh, they failed. Uh, if it was engineered in the United States as a weapon of war, they failed. It's it's a nasty little bug, but it's nothing like a weapon of war. It's less less uh, dangerous, less fatal than um, the common flu. And uh, but they're trying to play it up and make it. Oh, everybody's dying, and it's all theater. It really is. These doctors are on top of it. And if anybody wants to hear what they have to say, come to our Red Pill University. Dot org. We're putting up videos of all of interviews and statements from all of these, these world-class doctors and researchers. So you can get the shocking story that these, there are forces that be, and we'd like to call it the PTB, the, you know, the, um, uh, the, what is it, the PTB, the, the, I forgot what it stands for. What is it? Powers uh, that be. Powers that be. Thank you. Not the P. I knew people that be was it. <laughs> Not sure they're people, powers but they're powers. Be, yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that mythical they, whoever they are, whether they're real 
and there are a lot of them. Uh, and, and they have been uh, creating this myth because they all have their own agendas. I mean, we've just talked about the banks and the bankers. Their agenda is to hide their culpability and uh, their culpability in the, um, the fact that the economy is going to go belly up. I'm going to blame it on the virus. The politicians who have good, great power mad instincts like the coronavirus because it gives them an excuse to clamp down and take away all the uh, freedom of movement, freedom of speech, get everybody in a state of fear. And it, it, it's essentially uh, martial law, voluntarily accepted by the people themselves, not being forced on them by guns and soldiers, but by propaganda and fear. And, oh, I've got to stay in my house you know, because I don't want to die and I don't want to kill somebody else accidentally. They really fall for that. And um, I mean, I, I'm not blaming them. I don't, I don't mean to make this sound like it's trivial. I mean, under other circumstances, I think I could have probably been in that category myself. But I happen to have had a chance to talk to some of the top researchers in the country and medical people, and I know better. So uh, I'm talking around the topic of dumping a lot of stuff out. I look at this as a time of real crisis and change. And unfortunately, the way it's going right now, it's, not, it's going not well, because most people are accepting these, these scenarios. They accept the fact that the banking system is there to help us. They accept the fact that the coronavirus is really a deadly, terrible pandemic. And they accept the fact that the political leaders who are making the big decisions on what we can do, what we can say on the internet, uh, what we can, where we can go, how we can, all those people, the assumption is what well, they have our best interests at heart too. And those are the myths of the day. These people do not care about us. They want to control us. Right. Now, Ed, you have always been such a fighter for the truth. Um, it's interesting to note the fact that after all of your accomplishments in terms of being a famous author, um, a filmmaker, your illustrious career of founding organizations, including the Red Pill University, your profile on Wikipedia at the um, known for category has two words on it. I don't know if you've seen this or not. Oh, are you kidding? Oh. <laughs> your whole yeah, career is thing, wrapped up. Yes. As, the first thing off the bat, G. Edward Griffin, well-known conspiracy theorist. Yes. Two right words. Right up front. Yeah. Conspiracy well, who theories. That, and Who put that there? Right. Who do you suppose put that there? Talk to us about who puts, who puts this up there? Who controls this? Interesting country? question, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> I happen to know. Because it hit me, I thought, what's this conspiracy theory stuff? I mean, I believe that there are conspiracies in the world. To, to classify me as a conspiracy theorist, of course, I know, know why they did it, uh, because they wanted to discredit me in the eyes of somebody. Said, Let me check this guy out. Oh, he's a conspiracy. He's a nut. Okay, that, that works. So who did it? I uh, never thought I could find out uh, so easily. But a couple of years ago, when this was all buzzing along, by the way, I never put anything up for my my entry on Wikipedia. I never, I just never did it. Right. And, but somebody, other people did. So I looked at, oh, look, look, they've got me in Wikipedia. And it, it was pretty straightforward. But then all of a sudden, boom, came the conspiracy theorist that got tagged up at the first, first three words or four words of the right. whole thing. I said, well, how did that happen? I didn't know. I didn't, well, I can't say I didn't care, but I didn't think I could do anything about it anyway. So uh, I had some people tell me that they had gone in and voluntarily took that down and replaced it. But immediately, like within 20 minutes, somebody had put it back again. It's like somebody was watching them, uh, making sure that the, uh, that those words remained in my uh, summary. So then I got an email from a lady. I'll leave her name off for now. She will be known one of these days soon because I've been encouraging her, her to write a book. She is one of, the, one of the top editors at Wikipedia. She said, Mr. Griffin, you don't know me, but, and you don't know this, but you are at the center of a big controversy here, here at Wikipedia. I said, I am? Really? No kidding. I actually got eventually on the phone with her. She said, yes. Yeah. She says, uh, they, uh, somebody was complaining about uh, what they did to your biography 
calling you a conspiracy theorist. And she said, I didn't, I never didn't know anything about you. So I, she said, I had to weigh in on the discussion. And she said, I started looking at your stuff. And she said, I didn't know you'd done these things before. And I read your stuff and I examined it carefully, thinking that you were probably some kind of a nut. And she said, I realized that, that they were doing a hatchet job on you. So she said, I spoke up. And a couple, it's one other editor also spoke up. The first thing, we're, we've got a big problem in the back room. She said, I'll give you the link. Anybody, by the way, if you have the link, can go in and see how these Wikipedia editors decide things. It's, it's really public, but you have to know how to navigate back to it. And I found this, this huge file. If it had been a paper file, it would have been this tall of all these emails back and forth among the editors at Wikipedia about me about this terrible guy or this, hey, he's not such a terrible guy. Oh, he's terrible. Oh, he's not. Such, I was in the center of a controversy. And it turns out that there are some very senior people at Wikipedia who have uh, the authority to override everybody else. Uh, it's, it's an interesting thing, but you, you earn, in a way, you earn your authority by making edits on Wikipedia. So those who make the most edits over the most time get the most points, get the most power, and then it just sort of gains, you know? And there are some people that have been there for a long time who were overriding the other editors because they had more points in their scale or something like that. And uh, she said, so I started looking into these people. She says, I know them. And she said, I find out, oh, well, they're really, they're, what do they call them? Uh, they work for the pharmaceutical company. They're on the payroll of the pharmaceutical company. It's under the table, but these people do nothing all day long except to monitor Wikipedia. And anytime they see anybody say anything that is against the, uh, the uh, prestige uh, or the image of the pharmaceutical industry, if they start talking about natural uh, cures as opposed to, to pharmaceutical cures, then immediately they're labeled conspiracy theorists. Or, or they're taken down or given some other label. She said, there are people that do nothing all day long and they work in shifts. So there's always somebody on the internet getting paid. They're not doing this out of the goodness of their heart. They're, they're, empl they're shills, they're employees of various industries. This is not just the pharmaceutical industry, but every big corporation has people like that on uh, doing nothing but monitoring the internet Wikipedia and making sure that everything that's adverse to their best interests is immediately removed. And since they're making all of these, these comments all the time, it gives them rank. And so all you need to be is a, is a, is a very wealthy co a corporation. They can afford to hire a couple of people that do nothing but work on uh, submissions at Wikipedia. And you can change the, the uh, value of everything on there. And she says, uh, in fact, this woman here told me that she was actually, uh, I don't know what they call it, demoted or silenced for a little while because of this controversy. And she was told if she didn't get off of this, she was going to be out completely. So I said, why don't you write a book? She says, I think I will, but she's very busy. We're trying to get that book out. I learned a lot about Wikipedia from talking to this gal. And then I finally got a call from the other woman who was involved in this controversy, and she confirmed everything was the same. So that's how that happens. It's not just uh, truth. That's it's so incredible. And the reason I bring this up is because it's the first thing that people usually do is Google somebody if they want to hear something about them. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, um, we've come to the point where we use memes, we use two or three words to describe somebody, and then we move on. And it's so yeah. extraordinary that someone like yourself, because you have, and I want to go back, and I know everybody wants to go back to your theories on the coronavirus. Um, how do you think this is going to turn out? Because um, I, I think you believe, as I believe, that this has been completely blown out of proportion. Um, the reason I believe it is because just because of the numbers, the sheer numbers of people that die from the flu, that die from cancer, that die from, that go missing, that, you know, um, the, the, the sheer numbers of things that happen that people don't even hear. I mean, 600,000 children go missing every year in just the United States. 600,000. And we hear nothing about it. Yet we have about 13,000 deaths so far from essentially the flu and the whole global economy is shut 
down. Yeah. So what, this what is more amazing. Do you need right there. Hmm? What more do you need? I, so what more do you need to see that there's something wrong? So what's your theory behind this? Go deep for us. Well, we're back to that ugly scenario. And that is that there is, there is an elite. And this is not a conspiracy theory. I mean, this is a matter of history, not conspiracy. And people know it. We, we know that there are very powerful financial families. I mean, like the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers and the Morgans and things like that. We think, oh, well, yeah, they're, yeah, they're very powerful. They're very wealthy. But they, they're, they're not making anything happen. <laughs> you know, because I didn't read about it in the paper, and surely if they, if these people were involved, we'd read it in the newspaper, wouldn't we? And of course, they don't realize that the newspapers are owned by these people, or at least people own the mortgages to their equipment or whatever. Anyway, so people just don't know; they haven't heard. Uh, there are there are powerful elitists who belong. They 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 nest around an organization called the Council on foreign relations that seems to be the the favorite uh, if you want to find who's running the world and at least who's running america go get a membership list of the council on foreign relations it used to be pretty hard to get but now it's i think it's online and it's about 4500 people something like that it sounds like a lot of people but you look at that list and it'll knock your socks off these are the people who run america they're the top level politicians. They're going to find presidents of the United States, senators, congressmen, members of the Supreme Court, secretaries of state, ambassadors, heads of corporations like ABC, CBS, NBC, Turner Broadcasting. I mean, all, all, of, all of the great newspapers, New York Times, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, Time Magazine, Look Magazine. I mean, uh, we've got a list of that on our site. I mean, the list goes on and on. This 4,500 people are not selling shoes or welding broken pieces on your car. They're the ones that are making the decisions of what happens in this nation. These are the people are, who are making the plans that are unfolding before us now. And it's important to know that if you look at that organization, the Council on Foreign Relations, it sounds rather academic, but in their own documents, they say our goal is world government, world governance. They call some they finally call it the new world order. They want to change the systems of all of the world. They want to get rid of all national boundaries, and they're doing a darn good job of it, and get rid of all national monetary systems. They want everything merged into one global system. This is their dream. And that when you think what that means, that means the elimination of the United States of America as a nation. They never say that. They just say, we're looking for global cooperation and um, an end to national sovereignty and things like that. So this is the goal of these people and they're running the show. So why is this happening? It's happening because it fulfills their goals, their dream. They have, in order to create a true world government, based on the model of collectivism. It's just not any government. Let me back off for a second on that because this is a very important matter. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to state control or governments as we like to call them, uh, but I wanna know what kind. Not any kind is okay. I mean, if, if, if world government is all we care about and we don't care what kind of a world government, well, we might as well have let Adolf Hitler do the job in the first place because that's what he had in mind was world government. And so did Joseph Stalin. And so do all world tyrants, they want world government. And, but we know because we know a little bit about them that this wouldn't be a good thing. But because we're told it's democracy and because it's our government now leading the fray for that, well, it's gotta be a good thing. People have to start asking, what kind of a government is this going to be? Is it gonna to be top down with all directions and, and authority? We have to, at the bottom, we just have to hope and pray that they're gonna treat us well we obey or else we die? Or is it going to be the kind that we had here in our own country for so many years, a republic in which the government served the people, didn't control the people? It's an important concept. So anyway, the kind that's being built by the, the members of the Council on Foreign, Ration, uh, Foreign Relations is the top-down type. 
They want to control everything. They want to make the decisions. And we'll be told what to do because it's for our own best interest and we must obey. So that is a pretty good definition of tyranny, even though it's masked as being for our own best interest. That's what's happening. And uh, that if once you understand that and get your mind around it, that this is true, it's not just some make-believe horror story. It's true. It's really happening. Then that answers all the questions. That's where we're headed. We're headed because that's where they want us to go. It's not just an accidental event in history, the drift of history. This is We're being pushed that way. And they know, and not just they, historians over the centuries have said that the best way to control the masses is to scare the heck out of them, to keep them always in flight and fright mode. That's why Machiavelli wrote in his Prince, in his book called The Prince, he said that you want to the, to the prince that he was trying to get a job with, the prince, uh, he said, if you want to maintain your, your position of power and the, po the population is getting a little nervous about what you're doing and they're restless and you don't want a revolution on your hands, you better get involved in a war. Or you better have an enemy. You better have a war, a real war, so or a threat of war, uh, so that the people will say, "Well, we have to put up with it because now, if if we don't support our leaders in this time of of, of crisis, well, we're going to lose the war and we'll be slaves." They don't realize they're already slaves. But people under great threats of war, or famine, or disease, or anything, crime, pornography. Uh, pedophilia, any, whatever it is that they scare us with, daily, by the hour, every minute you turn on your TV set, it, ah, be afraid of this, Ooh, be afraid of that, Ooh, be afraid of terrorism, right? And once you're in that mode, people don't ask questions about, but is it constitutional? They want to say, well, let's just, let's get it done with, let's get rid of this threat, and then we'll worry about constitutional and, and freedom, freedom rights and that sort of thing later. And they know this. It's, it's, it's a master strategy. You get, if you want to conquer a people without having to use bayonets and bombs, and you want them to be voluntarily submissive, frighten them, scare them, convince them that they're on the ed edge of extinction. This is the tactic, and it's been used successfully for hundreds and hundreds of years, and it's been used very effectively in the United States, for the past couple of decades, in fact, it's been used right now. It's that uh, to, to me, I, every time I turn on my TV, I have to turn it off because all I see is this scare, scare, scare tactic. And most of it, not all, but most of it is either completely fabricated or exaggerated beyond measure. Right. So do you believe that this is all a wrap up? This is a um, very coincidental that you know six or eight months ago the um incredible printing of our currency was um started with trillions and trillions of dollars a day and we're watching the stock market you know predicted to crash and then all of a sudden the coronavirus comes out so we lose millions and millions of jobs based upon again something that looks like a rather mild flu um of course, people die from it because people have people weakened die from the flu. Right. They die yeah. from the flu. More people Absolutely. die from the flu, people with weakened immune systems. But mm -hmm. um, what you said a little earlier um, was very interesting, and I'm sure everyone's very interested in it, that this coordinated pop, of our economy, the fall, is something that is probably um, actually written on someone's calendar somewhere. <laughs> so they know exactly, is what you're saying, when the pop will happen. And um, so that they can go in, just like with the Great Depression, you know, I've had Wayne Jett on a couple of times. He's a fabulous author about the Great Depression. He has the exact same words as you do that it was orchestrated, that it was planned, that Joe Kennedy was ready for it, had his cash ready for when all the stocks would crash so he could buy everything, uh, Joe Kennedy being um, JFK's father. And a um, uh, very interesting scenario, but talk to us a little bit more about that. So do you honestly believe that this is so coordinated they know exactly when it's going to happen? Well, 
Uh, but it's a two-part question. I, I know that it's coordinated, and but I don't think they know exactly when it's, but they know when it's going to happen, but not exactly like the exact day or the exact minute and so forth. But they got it close enough. You know, it, it's going to be like probably um, uh, June or something like that. And probably within a month or two, they've got a pretty good idea because they're making it happen. It's uh, these decisions. I mean, somebody made a decision to convert the coronavirus scare into a, a global problem. Somebody made that decision. You look at what they're saying on the news in Europe, the phraseology is exactly the same as they're saying here. The same photo, <laughs> this is funny by the way, uh, it happened actually a couple of times. Uh, in New York, they uh, were publishing some videos and some photographs of the, uh, the pandemonium that was going on in, in New York hospitals, you know, because all oh, people were dying and they had, and these were running around the halls and the patients were sitting there like this and the nurses were running everywhere and, and they were saying, and there were 3,000 people that died at noon and then all this was going on. And it turns out that the footage was taken from Italy. <laughs> And uh, it, was all, it was all completely theater. And, but most people don't know that, even though it's been published now in the alternative media. There are the pictures side by side. This one comes from Europe. This one is the one they said it was happening in New York. Same picture. I mean, it's theater, folks. And people <laughs> and, don't uh, see that. Or, or, or when you show it to them, it's almost like they'd rather be frightened than believe the yeah, truth. Yeah, they, they think, oh, no, that's an anomaly. That can't be. Oh, that was a mistake, or they just had, they just pulled a stock photo off and so forth, but it really happened, you know. Well, things really are happening. There's no question about that. Uh, if, if you come to our sites, you'll see that we have citizen reporters going out all the time with their cameras, and there's this milling around the hospitals around the U.S. The parking lots are empty, folks. There are no people lined up, except there was one video. We found out there was a lot of people lined up, but the next day there weren't. <laughs> because somebody went with their camera and it was empty. It was, that day, though, when they did the video documentary, it was loaded with people with their masks on waiting to be treated, right? But the next day and the next, no, it was all gone. So people are going around taking pictures of these hospitals all around the country. Their parking lots are empty. Some of them actually go into the, into the emergency room, to the waiting room. They, they have the cameras sort of tipped down because you're not supposed to take pictures of people. But you can see there's nobody in there, maybe two. They've got a place, maybe an arena to sit a hundred people, and there are two people sitting in there. And every time you see a picture of somebody standing in front of a gymnasium full of beds, ready for all these corona victims, the beds are empty, folks. You, you've never seen one with people in the beds. Uh, they're closing these things down, uh, these gymnasium type emergency rooms, these big massive tents that have been set up, because they're empty. That nobody's using them. There is no pandemic except on video, except on TV. It's uh, like the tail wags the dog. Remember that movie where they, the president had some kind of an embarrassing uh, situation, probably some kind of a sex scandal. I've forgotten, but they had to get the the focus of the attention away from the president, uh, so he didn't lose his election. And so they invented a war, and they conducted a war that broke out in the Middle East someplace and the United States was involved. And it was all done in the studio. It never even happened. <laughs> it was yeah. a movie. It's pretty good, actually. <laughs> and, I mean, yeah. And it was even trending there on Twitter, um, the same sort of philosophy you're talking about. Everybody was taking photographs and video of their local hospitals and nobody, you know, there Nobody's was there. no, there's no pandemic. There's no, the, the hospitals are empty. The, yeah, and this was in New York too. I mean, where, you know, and then the government, you know, the governor I comes know. on and he's I like, know. oh, we're out of supplies. I want to ask you something while we have you here with your perspective on this, that this may indeed be a coordinated effort. What are your thoughts about the latest with the World Health organization and the vaccinations that they were talking about because if indeed this is not a pandemic why are they putting so much emphasis upon a global vaccination and um what are your thoughts on that real quick i just want to get your well mind. it's more than just thoughts the documentation on this and the whistleblowers and all that makes it very clear uh the two agencies that are looked to 
most for uh, responsible and correct information is the World Health Organization and the CDC. And um, both of those organizations are 100% corrupt. They've been, they were targeted long ago in anticipation of this kind of thing by the pharmaceutical industry. And you look at the people that staff those organizations, where they come from, and where their funding comes from and uh, what organizations they belong to, you find that it's top to bottom, uh, pretty much the, uh, the powers that be, as we <laughs> were talking about. This, they're all part of the club. And um, they, in fact, the uh, World Health Organization has been caught with its trousers down time and time and time again. If you think back over all the, the flu epidemics we've had, in the last couple of decades. They're all duds. But at the time, it was, oh, the end of the world, you know? And uh, it was just propaganda to justify the sale of millions and billions of vaccines to the government so that they could administer them to the people free. And um, it was an economic boon to the pharmaceutical companies. So the, the pharmaceutical industry is corrupt. And we just put it, that's the, probably the most gentle way of saying it. And they spend a lot of money to influence the people in top positions at the CDC and the World Health Organization. And those people do pretty much what they're expected to do, which is to support the, the drama, the theater, that we have a terrible world problem on our hands and we better get those vaccines coming as soon as possible. You've got people like, like Bill Gates, on television all the time. He said, well, we're going to have a rough time for the next six or seven or eight months until we get the vaccines and we're working on the vaccines. But, but don't worry, folks, the vaccines, when they come, everything will be fine. Oh, they ain't seen nothing in the way of a problem until they see what those vaccines are going to do to people. That's it's not I mean. just money. Yeah. This is an ugly, ugly side of it. You can sort of laugh it off and well, they're, they're, they're stealing money from people. They're, they're nothing but suede shoe con artists. And you think, well, yeah, that's W.C. Fields and his crew need to go. But now we're talking about things that kill people, mm -hmm. that cause physical harm and break up families. And when not only death, but what people are harmed for life, they're crippled. Autism creeps into this picture and their, their neurological systems are impaired forever. They become walking dead. We're talking about that kind of thing. And there, this is no longer funny. I would be amiss to not mention that um, Bill Gates has become, we've always known he's been greatly involved with vaccinations and that um, elsewhere around the world, he's actually being sued by several countries because the vaccinations contain things that they turned out to be sterility um, vaccinations. But this was, this is a different kind of animal when you're talking about someone that presents a vaccination as one thing. And in fact, what is held in that needle is something completely different. Um, not to mention Microsoft has somehow gotten involved in that they would offer tattoos to people who have gotten their vaccination. Now that you've gotten vaxxed, come get your, your cool tat. You know what I mean? So everybody can walk yeah. around with their tattoos. Yeah, you know? it's, a little, they, it's like a little patch. Right. We have a, a lot of little needles on it. And actually, I believe they deliver the, uh, some of the vaccines too. Like it's a little patch and they just press it on your arm. I saw a picture of it the other day. And it not only uh, infuses through the skin very effectively, but it also has some dyes that remain on your arm. And it'll last, I think they said for nine years or something like that. And, and that's long enough before you have to get your next shot again, you know. But you talk about being tattooed. Remember the, remember the people in Auschwitz and Bitterfeld in the Nazi war camps? They were tattooed, weren't they? I keep thinking about that. I'm, I'm beginning to think that these vaccine tattoos will be kind of a, a symbol of being a prisoner. You don't have freedom to choose. They're going to force you to take these vaccines, whether you like them or not, or go to prison. Or actually, I don't think prison is going to be so much the method anymore, although it still will be there. I think they're going to follow the China model, where it's the social 
scoring system. If you don't do what you're supposed to do, like take your vaccine and stay in your house or, or don't say anything bad on the internet, do what you're do, supposed to do as a good citizen. If you don't do that, well, you won't be able to travel. You won't be able to get on an airplane. In fact, if you're really bad, you won't even be able to get on a subway. You won't even be able to buy gasoline. You're going nowhere, baby. And oh, by the way, you don't get any food stamps either. And you know, you have to have food stamps to get food. So this is the ultimate control. And uh, they're openly talking about, they're building it right now in the United States. And they're openly talking about it, folks. If you haven't picked up on that, go on the internet and look for these key words, you know, social credit, social scoring, surveillance technology. Uh, it's underway. And your politicians, the people that you have voted into office, are behind this. They're making it happen. They're raising, oh yeah, how much money do you need? Another billion dollars? Yeah, vote for it because this is going to help fight coronavirus. Yep, that's how it's working. And Ed, who knows what's in that vaccine? Well, a lot of people know what's in that vaccine. Adjuvants, primarily. But first of all, the the antibodies that they put in there. Well, the, First of all, it's not an effective treatment of disease. That's a blown way out of proportion. But that's not the big problem. You named it as the adjuvants, the other things they put in in order to make it more effective than it really is. And we're talking about toxins like mercury and aluminum and uh, animal DNA. I don't know where the, why they put this stuff in there, but it's, uh, it's highly toxic and it's destroying people's nerv their nervous systems and their immune systems as well. Right. They're and killing you, people, in other words. Yeah, you've mentioned Auschwitz a couple of times. Um, this just has such an identical ring to everything. You know, the, the tattoos and the, you've gotta have the mark. It's like the mark of the beast, but you've gotta have the mark in order to be socially accepted. Like you mentioned, you know, be able to travel or get your food stamps or do whatever you're gonna do. And, and, it's, and you know, it's gonna have all kinds of celebrities. Hey, get your tat, you know, we're so cool. Yeah. Look what we've got it, you get it too, you know, kind of a sales pitch. But um, it's, uh, do you think, that this could have stemmed from the scientists that came over from Germany? And do you think it was all started because it's the same kind of experimentation? It's the same type of chemical, Boy. you know, <laughs> what do you, what that, do you that is a really interesting topic. And I can tell by the fact that you've just asked the question that you, you know a lot about it. Yes, that you're talking about Operation Paperclip at the end of World War II under the direction of uh, Alan Dulles, who was our Secretary of State at the time, CFR member, by the way, uh, they took as many of the Nazi scientists that they could find who were involved in genetic work and, and uh, rocket science and anything that they thought would be useful. They falsified their biographies, they got them fake papers, and they imported them into the United States. You can go on the internet and you see some photographs of this group standing for their, for their group pictures, like a graduation class. All right, on one side, there's everybody standing there with all their Nazi SS uniforms and their caps and the, you know, everything, they're Nazis. And then here's the same group next to them, and they got suits and ties, and they're, I guess they're getting ready to get on the boat, and they're coming to the United States. They're given jobs. and uh, Von Braun was one of those people. He was a Nazi, of course, but he's only one. Now we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of people. And now they're Americans. <laughs> and uh, uh, they didn't get, they didn't go to the Nuremberg trials. And a lot of these people were involved in very deadly experiments on human beings, very things we're talking about. It wasn't all just rocket science. There was a lot of human engineering and moderation experiments to see what the limits of human tolerations could be. They were freezing people, see how long it would take before they die if they were freezing and things like that, They're horrible things, some of them. So that's Operation Paperclip and it's real. It's not a conspiracy theory at all. It's all in the history books, easy to document. But now, yeah, this it is traced to that. But now where the real interesting part comes is where did the Nazis get it? All that business about eugenics and controlling hereditary in, uh, characteristics of the human being to make him into a better human being. In other words, the idea behind the Aryan race that Hitler had, 
that came from the United States. That was funded by some of these tycoons that we were talking about earlier. And they were almost closed down here in the United States. The whole thing was shipped over to Germany and it was picked up by Adolf Hitler. And he said, this is perfect. And then it came back to us after World War II. This is not a German phenomenon. It's not an American phenomenon. It's an evil phenomenon. And whenever you find people with huge amounts of money and huge amounts of power, and they start to think about changing nature and changing humanity, changing the way you think, the way you act, and they want to control that for your own good, of course. You know, I don't care what nationality, what race, what culture you are. Once you get into that mode, you are about as as dangerous as any virus that you could ever dream. Right, right. It's just such an, ex, you know, an interesting um, parallel. It, it's almost, it's an extension. It's the same people that started the same thing and now it's almost coming to, their vision is coming to fruition unless we wake up and stop yes. it. Yeah, right. the second part. <laughs> wake up is, is very important, but the second part is equally important. Now that we're awake, do we just watch it and say, oh my goodness, I wonder what's going to happen <laughs> oh, next. No, no, no oh, it's happened. Look at that. Oh, did you hear that? No, no, we got to get out off of our big fat couches and get out there and do something. Not just go get locked in because it's for our own good. Now, you see the, the value of that one now. In order for real rebellion or uh, public opposition to take place anywhere. They have to get together. They have to meet together. They have coffee together. They have to lay their plans. <laughs> they have to go out and do public demonstrations. Well, if they're all locked up in their homes, like nice little citizens, that's never going to happen, is it? You see, it all comes to play. Right. It's such a comparison to Nazi Germany, everybody being locked in their homes, all afraid. You know, I mean, if you turn down the volume, the picture is the same thing. Um, this leads yeah. us to the fact that you are the chairman of the Red Pill Expo. And I'd like you to tell everybody about it. It's an extraordinary event. You have phenomenal speakers. You have uh, Robert um, Kiyosaki, um, the author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It's very exciting. And also, this October, Ed, it's being held, and I know I'm not telling you this, I'm telling everybody else this, it's being held at Jekyll Island. Amazing, talk to us about this. <laughs> yes, and in case any of your listeners wonder why that's such a big deal, it's because, indirectly, it's because the title of my book on the Federal Reserve is called The Creature from Jekyll Island, but the reason it's called The Creature from Jekyll Island is because that is the place where the Federal Reserve was concocted, it was hatched right there at a highly secret meeting. And uh, so yeah, I thought, well, let's just go to Jekyll Island and uh, stick our tongues out at the, these pictures on the wall of these great founders of the Federal Reserve, you know? So everybody thought it was a good idea. We did have it scheduled for, for June, but then this uh, quote unquote pandemic came along and everybody got scared, nobody wanted to commit, and then they started closing down uh, public places, so you can't have meetings and all that. So we had to push it forward uh, to, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, no, stop, I think it's October, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway, so we have the dates up there and at our website, by the way, I better get that in there uh, because I'll forget to mention it later. But if you want to know more about the Red Pill Expo, go to redpillexpo.org, redpillexpo.org. Red and you'll find the dates and the speakers and all that kind of thing. And now we're thinking, by the way, that we can't wait until October. Um, we're probably going to start putting a little live stream expos up very soon because we've amassed a lot of the... I, a moment ago, I was talking about these doctors and these researchers who have the real inside story about the coronavirus and all viruses, by the way, not just the coronavirus. And uh, they've all agreed, yes, we'd be happy to come and present at the Red Pill Expo. So we're going to have them there. But I hate to hold back the information. I think we've got to get these people online and so that everyone can hear this now. By October, the show may be over for all we know, you know. So uh, we're thinking if you come on to redpillexpo.org and just sign up to be on our mailing list or or if you're on my uh, news service called needtoknow.news, then you'll be getting bulletins as to what the latest changes are. Are we gonna have a live stream version of it and so forth? 
but that's, I think that's going to happen. Awesome. Awesome. Now, you know what? I want to take a moment before we go to ask you a sort of um, philosophical life question. From everything that you've seen and experienced throughout your career, what would be the most important thing that you could share in terms of our, our world, our leaders, our planet, our future? What would be the top knowledge that you've learned so far that you would want all of us to know? That's really pretty easy. Uh, it's, a, it's a staggering task to think the most important thing, but it's very clear in my mind what it is. And to, to make sense of it, I'll back up just a little bit. Why are all of these things happening that we're talking about, all of these negative things happening? Is there one thing that's more important than that? Well, of course, love of money, love of power, yes, of course. But is there something else maybe that acts as a, a synergistic, has a synergistic effect of these, this lust for power and money and control? And there, I discovered that there is. None of these things can happen unless there's coercion involved. You can be, you can, all these evil people could not uh, do anything to us unless they were able to use the power of government to force us to do these things. There's a tool involved, and that's the coercive power of government. And that wouldn't happen unless people believed in it, unless the people believed that it was the right thing to have governments with a lot of power. And now we're getting to the core of the answer to your question. Behind all of the evil things that are happening in the world today, in my view at least, there's this acceptance that almost everybody has made of an ideology. They don't even know that it has a name. They don't even know that they bought into it, but it has a name and it's called collectivism. When you look at communism, fascism, Nazism, socialism, all of the isms, I don't care what you call them, if you peel off that label and look underneath, you'll find that they all share the same, in, same ingredients of the belief system, and that system is called collectivism. I don't have time to go into all of it, but the most fundamental principle is that the individual has to be sacrificed if necessary for the greater good of the greater number. So all of the crimes that could possibly be conceived could be validated and turned into an honorable act simply by saying, but it was necessary for the greater good. We got into World War I, World War II, we got into the fight against terrorism, in some cases because we deliberately either caused death and destruction to our own people as justification to get into the war, for example. And we said, well, it's horrible to have to kill our own people, but it was necessary for the greater good of the country and for the world. FDR said that. All of his people said that after Pearl Harbor, when that was revealed. It was, uh, I think it was Titinius in his memoirs, he was asked after the war was over and it was, it was proven that the United States knew that the Japanese were preparing for an attack, but they deliberately withheld the information from the commanders at Pearl Harbor so they could be attacked viciously. And that led to several thousand American soldiers being killed and how many knows how many civilians too. And of course they denied they had any knowledge of it, but they knew it was coming. They had broken the Japanese code. They were encouraging the Japanese to come. They cleared all the warships out of the path so that, and, and, and commercial ships as well, so no radio operator could say, hey, we just see a bunch of Japanese warships going by here. Anybody know anything about that? They got all the ships out of the area, so that would be a clear zone. They made it so easy for the Japanese to attack. They knew the exact hour it was gonna happen, and then they said, oh, we've been attacked. It's the same old ploy. So, uh, I, I almost lost track of that, but it's the fact that I did lose it. So all of the, yeah, we, we did this. And then later on, Statinius writes in his memoirs, he said, yeah, it was, a, it was a hard decision to make. He said, but FDR made the right decision.
because without that decision, we wouldn't have gotten into the war. The American people didn't want to get into World War, uh, into the World War II. They didn't want anything to do with it. So if we hadn't done that, we couldn't have gotten into the war. And then maybe the Nazis and the Japanese would have attacked us on our own homeland. And, this, and the casualties would have been greater and it would have been more horrible. So it was, you see, the, it was an act of statesmanship, he said. An act of statesmanship to let that happen because it was for the greater good of the nation and the long haul. You can justify anything, any crime against humanity or an individual simply by saying, well, it's for your own good. It has to be that way. Lenin put it pretty well. He said, well, if you're going to make an omelet, you have to crack a few eggs. That is part of this thing called collectivism. So, and people believe that the the idea that the group is more important than the individual and all the other things that go along with collectivism, they have bought into it. Most Americans buy into it. If you, if you really peel off that label and you look at what the average American believes deep in his heart on these issues, it's no different than what the Nazis believe. It's no different. And it's a shocking thing, but they don't see it that way because it's our country and so forth. It's not the enemy. And we don't have a big ugly swastika. We got the stars and stripes. It wasn't always that way, by the way, folks. I'm, I'm not putting America down. I'm just saying she's been, she's been practically being killed right now. But anyway, I'm off the track. So I recognized some time ago that this idea of collectivism is the thing that makes all of this happen. The idea that we have to give power to the government to force people to comply with every, anything we say that's for their own good and we've got the power of government to force you to do it, that is what's killing us. Is there an opposite philosophy? And there is. And it'll, we'll never get rid of this collectivist uh, disease unless we have an antidote, unless we have something that's equal and opposite, only better. And the opposite to collectivism is another ideology called individualism. And the most important thing I learned, now I'm finally to your question, is to appreciate that we are living in a world in which there is a battle between two ideologies, collectivism on the one hand and individualism on the other. And you know, the problem is that we don't have enough soldiers on the side of individualism. Not enough people even know there's a war going on. And if they did, they don't have their ideology clearly formed in their mind. They don't know, say, they wanna be free. And you say, well, what's freedom? And most of them will just say, well, Freedom is means, uh, uh, means not being in jail. <laughs> no, no, means a lot more than that. <laughs> so this is the thing. Now, see if with that background, I'm going to answer your question. I think the most important thing I have learned is that we have to know the difference between individualism and collectivism. If we're ever going to understand what's happening today, and certainly if we're ever going to change it for the best or for the better. So what I learned is that I had to learn about what was, what are the fundamentals of liberty? What are those ingredients that make up collectivism and individualism as the opposite of it? And that is the reason I created Red Pill University and Freedom Force International, is to, to advocate and to explain and to, to encourage people to, to become adherents of the ideas of freedom become individualists and, and so when somebody says what do you believe uh, are you are you um, are you a conservative or a liberal you have to say come on get off of that what is a conservative or liberal you can't even define it i'm an individualist and that person is a collectivist now that we can define once we get to that point where people can say i believe in freedom for this reason this reason and this reason too any questions and we're ready to ready to debate these issues and understand what the the essence of the battle is, that's the day we turn this around. That's the greatest discovery I made. Amazing, amazing. Ed, you are always amazing. And this has been an incredible interview. Um, it's always such an honor to have you here. And I want you to please repeat where everyone can go to get more information about Red Pill University and um, the redpillexpo.org. And I also want you to clarify something very quickly. You said something we might not have until October. 
which is the reason you wanted to um, start streaming information. What did you mean by that? Well, what I meant by that is that this lockdown may not be lifted by October. And I'm beginning to think that these people, the PTB, the Council on Foreign Relations people and their ilk, uh, probably they would rather not release us from lockdown. I think they'd like to just keep tightening the screws a little bit at a time. Now, there's another strategy on that. They know that sometimes it's easier to push real hard and then ease off, you know, the old communist strategy of, of um, <clears throat> two steps forward, one step backward two steps forward, one step backward. Because when you appear to be in retreat, then your, your opposition relaxes. Even though it's not retreat, it's just a ploy. It's just to let them think that, oh, God, that's, that everything's over. But then as soon as they lower their guard, boom, another two steps forward, another two strikes. It's a strategy of warfare. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I don't know which ones these guys are gonna choose. I, I thought in the beginning that they would use the two steps, one step method. You know the, gun it with the gas and then hit the brake, gun it with the gas and hit the brake. But I'm beginning to suspect from what I'm reading now is that these people are saying, well, I don't think we're going to be able to lift the, the quarantine. It's, you know, the numbers are very bad. <laughs> so I don't think they want to lift it. So that's what I meant by it. It's possible that we'll still be in lockdown in October. You know, with millions of people out of work and what unemployment it, checks not They coming. want that, my dear. They want that, don't you see? They want that because that means they're going to be on their knees begging for help. And then the government will come along and say, we can help you. Here's your, here's your welfare check. Now you have to do everything we tell you, of course. And you better be good because you're going to get social credit. And if, if you say the wrong things and you're shown, you, we track you, you know, and we saw that yesterday you spent uh, five minutes with this other person. And this person has a very bad social score. And they might even have coronavirus. And we might decide that you have coronavirus now because you were in contact with, with them. So you have to now quarantine right now or you go to prison. I mean, this is coming. Can't you see it? And that's, they don't want to let go of that. Now, they may do the two steps, one step, or they may just keep going constantly. But I know this. <clears throat> Until we get these people out of positions of authority, it's going to continue going, either constantly or in jerking fashions. It's going to keep going. We have, we have to take this seriously. We have to get out there and do whatever we can to get these people out of their positions of authority. We have to do it. And that means political action. It means we have to get out on the streets, even though they say, you're not allowed out here. You can say, so what? This is a free country. And they're going to say, okay, into the van and whatever. But if, you're, if there are a million people out there, they don't have enough vans. So that's about our only hope, I think, right now. This is the stage we're in. Wow. And the vaccinations, too. Very scary. They're coming. They're coming before the end of the year, probably. Very scary. Ed, what are your, what are your websites for everyone? My websites. Thank you, dear. I appreciate that. I always forget that. Uh, okay. Well, I mentioned, uh, I did mention uh, redpilluniversity.org. That's where I'm spending most of my time right now, trying to get all this information we've been talking about into one place so that it can be indexed. I've been, I've been learning how to use Ajax, Pro, Ajax Search Pro <laughs> so that when you come to the Red Pill University, you can type in any word or any date or any topic you want, and bing, 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 it'll take you to all of the videos that we're in the process of and massing right now. And uh, so that's just about done. Expect a lot of work going on when you get there. But right now it's a fully functional site. That's the first thing, come. And, and if you're in doubt about some of these issues, and I, I presume you would be, I mean, unless you've been up to your nose, like I have been, where are you gonna get this information? It's not coming across from the, from the television set. So uh, yeah, the first step is to get up to speed and you have to make a decision on your own, is this true or not? because it does sound kind of wacky. I have to admit that, but you have to check it out for yourself. And then if you decide that it's really serious and we really need to do something about it, then come join with us. Uh, Red Pill University is the place I think to start. We're looking right now to form what we call chapters in every local community where there are say six people that want to 
do something about this. You'd be surprised how much power six people have if they get together and decide that they want to make a splash in their community. And they, I, I've been involved in, in one or two instances like that where starting with just three people and moving to a total number of maybe 15, we were able to uh, affect the election of a board of supervisors member and turn the, the balance on the county political structure with what? Starting with three people and maybe 15 people working. And then of course, getting a lot of others in to help us, but we were the core of it. You'd be surprised how a few people can make a big difference, but you can't do that quarantined in your home. You've got to get out. And that's why they don't want you getting out. So we got to get out and we're going to call these, we're calling them campuses for Red Pill University. So anyway, there's plenty to do. If you come to the point where you say, by golly, I've got something inside me ringing, the bell is ringing and it's saying, you've got to get out there and do something. If you're, you know, you're, crusader gene starts to rattle like mine is rattling all the time, then we'll have a program for you. So the short answer is go to redpilluniversity.org, get informed, make your decision if this is real or not, then make another decision. Are you willing to become part of the uh, the pullers at the oars or the riders in the boat? And uh, if, if you want to pull the oar, we've got some oars we're ready to hand out. Beautiful. Red Pill University. Ed, it is always amazing to have you on this show. Thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure you let me talk and ramble. And uh, I hope I didn't frighten any of your listeners too much. But uh, I speak the truth as I see it. Yes, you do. And Red Pill University is something for every American to take a look at and see how much you want to get involved. And it's not just America either. The whole world is in the grips of this struggle between individualism and collectivism. It's global. Yes, it is. Thank you, sir. Mr. G. Edward Griffin, writer, filmmaker, chairman of Red Pill Expo, and the author of The Creature from Jekyll Island. For the Industry Experts Panel, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com.